thank you, Shok San, for that very kind introduction. Um, Mr. Teo Chang Long, uh, you know, the uh, Board of Trustees of the uh, Nian Kong Si, Distinguished Practice Professor Dr. Uh, Augustine Tan, my old friend, honored guests, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm, I'm really very, very honored to be invited by the Nian Kong Si to deliver this very important, uh, uh, you know, distinguished lecture in conjunction with the Singapore Management University, SMU. I'm particularly grateful to, uh, you know, uh, Ms. Tan Siok San for extending the invitation on behalf uh, of the university, you know, and the Nian Kong Si. Of course, you know, my good friend, um, Ms. You know, Tan Siok Chu, no, no relative directly with Siok San, but of course, you know, uh, related to the Go family um, through the Balaka connection, uh, you, you know, help with the introduction. But, um, you know, uh, Ms. Tan Shok San's uh, late uh, father-in-law, Dr. Uh, Dr. Go Keng Sui, was one of the giants of Asian economic uh, and nation building who actually influenced a whole generation of bureaucrats, Asian bureaucrats like myself. Now, I still remember his book, uh, 1972, which is a treasured book in my library, which I brought today, on the economics of modernization, in which he started with a very modest preface to say that he was one of the few remaining members of a vanishing breed of political leaders who write their own speeches. Um, Nowadays, most politicians have lots of very young people to write the stuff for them. Now, my own achievements have been much more modest than that of Dr. Goh, someone whom I have admired and indeed followed in slightly uh, different paths, but with some similarities. I agree wholeheartedly with his view that those of us who take part in the great Asian drama, as Gunnar Murdao aptly calls it, cannot escape feelings of anguish. Now, anguish because Asians cannot explain in theoretical elegance our path of successful development, and yet through great pragmatism and no-nonsense common sense, which Dr. Goh showed in great abundance, Asians have rebuilt Asian, East Asian e econ economies without winning a single Nobel Prize in economics with the single exception, of course, of uh, Amartya Sen, who is a South Asian. So it doesn't quite count. Now, like Dr. Goh, actually our paths have certain similarities. I also worked on a currency board, but in my case, Hong Kong, not Singapore. And since I've stepped down, I've also become an advisor to China, so, as, just as he was you know, advised to China. And I always write my own speeches. Now, so it is very befitting that I should dedicate this 2010 lecture to the memory of the late Dr. Go Keng Sui. Now, I want to start on the uh, global financial crisis because it is very profound in its complexity. And this has shocked not only the advanced nations, but you know, where the, current, the crisis emanated from, but also the uh, Asian markets. Now, it's exactly two years and one month after Lehman Brothers failed. And the world is still reeling from you know, major shocks, right? Uh, uh, of, so, and there have been lots of reforms. So how effective are these reforms? What role, you know, what is going to be the future financial landscape? What role has Asia to play in this? and you know, how we're going to cope. These are very real questions, and you know, we have to answer them, whether we like it or not, right? So this lecture is divided into two parts. I'm going to divide it into two parts. Uh, the first, I shall provide a very brief overview of what I think happened during this crisis. That's the diagnosis part. Then I want to go into the prognosis part, what implications are there for, China, for, for uh, Asia, and what we Asian policymakers should be doing. Now, let me begin to be very bold. I'm going to do, I'm going to ask, what would 
Dr. Go have thought about this subject of the global financial crisis reform and the implications for Asia. First, he would be clinically objective about the crisis, taking not a technical view, but with an eye to history and the sociological aspects of this crisis. He would take a very broad view. He was not a narrow economist. He was, a very, he was very much, in my view, a Renaissance, Renaissance man. Second, he would take a non-sentimental assessment of what needs to be done. And third, he would act decisively on what he believed to be right, you know, not what would be expedient or convenient to most stakeholders. So unfortunately, as I shall try to demonstrate, the handling of this crisis has taken a very different path. Now, you know, the world has just gone through this most complex uh, and deepest financial crisis since the 1930s. This is a cliche you've all heard. And there are as many books, conferences, research papers given on this crisis more than the 1930s uh, Great Depression. No one can, of course, agree on the real causes nor the solutions. You know, it's, it's very controversial. Now, the only thing we can all agree on is that this crisis is much deeper and more costly than anyone has ever imagined. And I would be stupid if I were to declare before you that this crisis is over, right? It's dangerous enough to write about history. It's even more audacious to try and predict the future. But I think what I'll do is try and sketch out the, the sort of most salient features of this crisis, the re recent reforms, and I leave it to your judgment whether I'm right or wrong. Now, this is a three-part uh, discussion, which I, you know, since the last month, I've been in Singapore three times. The last month, I was at the first Singapore Global Dialogue, organized by the Rajaratnam School of International Studies, where I made the first analysis. You know, then, you know, last week, I was uh, at the Singapore Economic Policy uh, Forum, where I made the second part, and today you're hearing the third part. But I'll be very, very brief because you know, I don't want to repeat myself too much. But I think it's very useful to, to repeat what I said uh, at the RSIS. I don't think it was reported very well, but never mind, I will say it. And I'm sorry if I'm going to be very rude uh, and very direct, but I think that's what Dr. Goh would have you know, been fairly, what my wife calls intraocular, just straight to the point. Now, I, so I said we need global governance because the Singapore Global Dialogue was about governance, because of the threat of war weapons of mass destruction. And there are three types of weapons of mass destruction. The first is nuclear and biological weapons. The second is terrorism. And the third one is finance. Now, there's a trite phrase, first attributable to Warren Buffett, that financial derivatives are weapons of mass destruction. Of course, he's now the biggest investor in the one of the most important firms in Wall Street. But we should put this in perspective. How much did the war in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan cost? According to Joe Stiglitz, my good friend, which, who wrote a book about it, about $3 trillion. How much did the advanced countries pay to stop this financial crisis from worsening? This is not my figure. This is a figure given by FSA uh, UK, $13 trillion. That's equivalent to the GDP of the United States. So finance is a very major problem indeed. And, but we deal with these problems very, very differently. In the first two categories, you make them war criminals. On the last one, we give them more bonuses. Not many laughs, but you know, it's ironical. Anyway, putting it in this perspective, this is, we have to pay very serious attention to this crisis because all of us are paying for this. It's not just people in the advanced markets. We are all paying for it today because through either zero interest rates on our deposits for years to come, you know, higher taxation or lost jobs. Now, most of you will be familiar with all the reforms about the you know, Dodd-Frank Act, you know, the Euro European reform initiatives, and the work coming out of Basel, you know, the Financial Stability uh, uh, Board, and more recently, the Group of 30. So I'm not going to go, go into this. But there are very, two very sharply divided camps of opinion 
you know, out there. The official view is that we've done the fastest, you know, the most comprehensive reforms ever made, which the bankers are very angry about. You know, the recently there was a big fight between uh, uh, Mermin King and the uh, chairman of, uh, uh, sorry, the CEO of Citibank, uh, Vikram Pandey. You know, it's all over the papers, right? This would have been impossible during Dr. Goh's time, as you know. All the central bank governor, the Bank of England's governor, was famous for raising his eyebrows, and the bankers immediately agreed to do what he, he wanted to do. Today, give me which subsection of the which act, and I'll send all the top lawyers to argue with you why you as a regulator, you are wrong. Now, the critical view, considered by bankers, the lunatic fringe, is saying that nothing has changed, finance and world order has been captured by oligarchs, bankers are laughing all the way to higher bonuses, and that there will be another large crisis looming. Now, who said this? Not me. The oligarch story is by Simon Johnston, who happens to be the former chief economist of the IMF. So, you know, this is a pretty kind of very divided camp. Now, who's right? So I'm not going to give you my personal views on this. I mean, you, you probably understand where I'm coming from. But, you know, let me give you what serious people talk about this. Paul Volcker, he has gone on record in New York Times to say he only gives a B minus to this reforms of the United States. And I, don't, I, I agree with him because, uh, you know, the vocal rule was very diluted. But University of Chicago professor and Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals judge Richard Posner, he invented the term economic capture, has, you know, probably is, is an authority who can say this. He said there are four key reasons for this crisis. First, incompetent monetary policy, which produced a housing bubble that brought down the financial industry. Secondly, the inattention of the Fed and the SEC, which didn't understand the changing nature of the banking industry, particularly shadow banking. Third, the over-indebtedness of the American people and government, which has hampered the restoration of credit. And last but not least, the failure of the US Treasury and the Fed to realize that layman's bankruptcy would trigger a run on the banking industry, causing a global credit freeze. But to cut a very complex story short, I think it would be true to be say that there was, number one, failure in economic and finance theory, two, failure in monetary policy and financial supervision, three, failure in risk management and pricing of risks, and then having got into the soup, the rescue policies are too highly distortive for long-term sustainable recovery. I think, you know, that part, even if it's controversial, you know, we, we all agree we are, we're, we're in a very distorted environment. Now, how did we get into this? You know, we have to go back to a little bit to history. It was the combination of globalization, financial deregulation, communications technology, and financial engineering that gave this period since the 1980s called the Great Moderation. Very strong growth, very low inflation. Now, this period of stability gave a lot of complacency on the part of central bankers and financial supervisors who were then imbued by this free market fundamentalism to allow unfettered financial engineering. Right? A lot of this, in relatively kind words, is in my book, so I won't go too much into this. But the result was that unprecedented growth in finance, growing from roughly 108% of GDP in size to roughly five times global GDP uh, by the end of 2008. And this is the IMF calculations. right? Uh, so including the, but if you include the notional value of financial derivatives, the leverage is roughly 15 times. That's pretty large by any standards. So by any measurement, you know, and this is repeated by the uh, uh, IMF, the uh, Bank of England, you know, FSA, etc., the whole uh, banking industry has become very low, very highly geared, and almost had no liquidity, uh, uh, depending mostly on central banks to fund them in, in the event they got into trouble. And you add to this the, the dangerous blend of complexity, uh, no one, including the regulators, un, and maybe even the originators, 
understood the dangers of systemic risks in this highly interconnected system. And that's why people say nobody saw this crisis.